in framing this, I just really wanted to start with the, with the comment that I think it's conventional wisdom now that we're moving into a world which is increasingly dominated by the, by an, the urban agenda. We passed that 50% point at which more, um, more than half of the world's population is, is classed as urban. An academic and, I think, political discourse is really firmly focused on sustainability of urban settlements uh, as one of the key global challenges. Um, and much attention, I think, is focused on the growing power and influence of world cities, um, which in many instances are, are, are eclipsing the nation state uh, in an increasingly globalized world. And in this presentation, what we want to do is try and look at the case for perhaps thinking again about the urban and rural uh, balance and how effective we are at achieving sus uh, a sustainable balance in the way in which we distribute um, human activity across the planet. And I'm drawing really on finding some research which I undertook for the uh, Royal Town Planning Institute on the role which local enterprise partnerships have played in the strategic planning process. And point, I think, emerging from that research may be a new geography of planning, certainly in the Southwest, which I hope provides a better basis for a more strategic approach to planning and thinking about how we want our urban settlements to grow. And it's in that context that Matthew's going to talk about the potential role which garden villages could play in that. Um, well, the focus of research was, um, that I undertook was firmly upon the southwest. I think that provides um, uh, the basis for some broader lessons to be drawn about the need to plan for, for global sustainability based on finding the right balance between the urban and the rural. Um, for all the attention that's been focused on uh, the growing role of megacities um, and rapid urbanization, which we can see advancing almost on a daily basis in, in countries like China and India, the fact remains that by 2030, more than two-thirds of the global population will remain in, urban, in, in rural areas or in cities that are under half, um, uh, half a, a million people. So we, we actually need to remind ourselves that we, live, um, we, d we don't live in a predominantly metropolitan world, although it's evident from the, uh, that major cities dominate uh, the distribution of information and power and the flows of people and capital. Um, we've only got to reflect on the role which London plays in the UK, but also I think we can reflect on the disconnect which often exists between metropolitan elites and the rest of the country. And I think we might not have ended up with some of the decisions we've had if people were more aware of that disconnect. Um, as the most rural region of England, the pattern of settlement I think found in the southwest is arguably more typical of the challenges facing the majority of the world than the metropolitan southeast, for example, or the industrial regions of the, of the north and midlands of, of England. Um, and this diagram which shows the proportion of uh, population classed as urban, um, as defined by the ONS, is perhaps a little misleading. Half of the population of the southwest lives in towns or villages of less than 20,000 people. Um, and Bristol, Plymouth and Bournemouth Pool, as our main urban centres, have populations of, of less than this ha um, half, half a million threshold. So I would argue that I think in many ways the southwest offers uh, a, a non-metropolitan settlement model which is perhaps more relevant um, than the focus that you often find on major metropolitan centres. Um, but the extent of the challenge associated with that um, uh, geography is revealed by findings of recent research which has explored the differences in the household uh, carbon footprint across the regions of the European Union. Uh, the figure on the left um, suggests that perhaps while the, uh, the total household carbon footprint in the southwest is not particularly high, I, I appreciate it's a small image, but that little green dot on the corner, we know where we all are. Um, when we start to look at that in terms of per capita uh, household carbon footprint, we actually emerge as one of the worst performing regions in, the U in, in, in Europe. 
Um, and that outcome seems to be the result of the combination of factors used in, in modeling, notwithstanding the challenges which exist in trying to undertake this sort of modeling exercise, drawing on data from a wide variety of sources. So to try and unbundle that a bit more, um, you know, this uh, research undertaken by Minks et al. shows really that socioeconomic and demographic factors are major determinants of carbon footprint per capita. Um, for example, carbon footprint increases with income levels because we have more money to spend on stuff. Um, educational attainment, there's very strong links between education attainment and income levels, or at least that's what the student grants people say. Um, uh, car ownership levels, and uh, 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 but uh, carbon footprint per capita reduces with household size and population density. So for the southwest, having a low density of population with a high car dependency, living in small households, typically of a more elderly profile, that's not a recipe for a sustainable lifestyle, uh, particularly when combined with the thermal quality of much of our housing stock. As a planner, I'm kind of interested in the degree to which spatial characteristics and settlement patterns contribute to carbon footprints. Um, and the research, again, undertaken by Minx et al., is, is kind of less clear in what those impacts might be. While there's a positive relationship between settlement type and per capita CO2 emissions with urban areas being at lower levels than, than rural areas, that relationship starts to break down when per capita carbon footprint is examined. And that appears to be due to different levels of household income and consumption patterns between urban and rural lifestyles. So it seems that there's something about urban lifestyles that is driving uh, um, uh, higher levels of um, carbon footprint. But the prevailing view of planners is that we should be promoting denser urban forms in order to achieve more sustainable living. So we see, despite some of the ambiguous evidence that exists, an effort to focus development on, on strategically significant towns and cities, to develop on brownfield land within urban areas, uh, to increase our housing densities by fixing minimum housing densities, to deliver urban growth through mixed use, sequential development on the edge of towns and cities through urban extensions, and to focus increasingly on smaller households, which kind of reflects um, uh, the changing demographic basis of our population. And this, the strategic environmental uh, assessments which sit behind these plans, I have to say, I feel are paper thin. They're not really addressing um, the, the, the challenges. And you can see uh, the way in which this conventional wisdom in planning is driving um, uh, our decisions about the way in which, for example, in Plymouth and Southwest, we're directing a high proportion of growth to Plymouth and the urban fringe, including a new settlement at Sherford, and more incremental growth around the market towns of South Hams and West Devon. But does that represent a truly sustainable balance between urban and rural living? And what, what will its impact be in terms of uh, the ultimate carbon footprint of that approach? What we're seeing, I think, is um, a disconnect between the way in which we're planning and thinking about these things and, uh, and, and the reality. So th this approach is failing, I think, to, to, to reflect the way in which people are changing their lives. So on the left-hand side, here, a map which shows the travel to work area from Exeter, which has seen substantial employment-led urban growth, um, to uh, 2011, where, as a result of that urban growth, we're seeing uh, uh, Exeter drawing on a much wider area, giving rise to commuting, uh, congestion, and pressure on environmental resources. Um, and I fear that the abolition of a strategic approach to planning in the southwest with the abolition of the uh, regional development agency and regional spatial strategies has, has um, kind of removed our ability to tackle these things. And they've been replaced by local enterprise partnerships who have taken a um, single-mindedly economic growth uh, uh, um, uh, approach. But the good news is that because planning authorities are so strapped for cash, they've been one of the most um, uh, heavily affected 
uh, areas of local government activity in terms of budget cuts, we're beginning to see a new planning geography emerge um, uh, where local authorities are having to work together to find practical ways both of delivering their plans but also responding to how housing and property markets operate. And I think uh, there's a new generation of uh, joint plans that are emerging which I think are, an, are enabling us to think perhaps again about the patterns of growth which can help address the region's carbon footprint challenge. And, and I've been doing some work with the Greater Extra Strategic Plan team who are beginning to explore um, spatial options for development um, in the Greater Exeter area. And already in that area you see urban extensions around the east side of Exeter, you see new settlements at Cranbrook, and now to the east of Columpton, a new garden village proposed. And I think that 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 approach of beginning to think again more fundamentally about what sustainable patterns of growth might be in this type of region, finding the right balance between the urban and the rural is a, a kind of real issue where I think researchers and policy makers ought to be focusing their attention. And, and now it's my, my pleasure to sort of bring Matthew on uh, to talk really about his work, both in terms of uh, his chairmanship of the Living and Working Countryside Report, which was extremely influential in, in uh, affecting thinking about planning, which then led on to him um, being given the role by the coalition government to lead the review of national planning practice guidance, and his um, work on garden villages as a potential uh, response to the problem of housing need, I think has been hugely influential. Indeed, he tabled an amendment to the Neighbourhood Planning Bill, which is now an act, in which I'm pleased to say he acknowledged his role as visiting professor at Plymouth University, um, which sets up powers for local authorities to uh, set up local development corporations to deliver garden villages. So, Matthew, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your views on how you think garden villages can contribute to this. Thank you very much indeed, and I want to uh, uh, reflect on, uh, pull out a couple of things uh, around sustainability that I think is really important and is one of the issues and challenges that's often put to me in developing uh, the approach of uh, smaller new settlements to deliver uh, much of the housing need that isn't being met by uh, the current uh, planning emphasis on urban uh, extensions. And that challenge is around its sustainability. And what you heard from Chris highlighted, uh, firstly, that it's often thought that uh, concentrating development in and around uh, existing urban centres is fundamentally more sustainable than concentrating uh, development in more dispersed ways, or, or indeed uh, through new settlements. Uh, and actually, uh, as we saw, uh, the data on that in terms of carbon impacts is, is actually rather ambiguous. The differences are not as great as we think, and looking at carbon footprint, one could argue there's not a difference at all. But if you look at this map, uh, this happens to be a market town, but you could actually take it as a much larger settlement. Uh, the red area is essentially the area in which for, it says traditional, well, really what we're talking traditional there is the last 20, 30 years, development has been concentrated around the edge. I say only the last 20, 30 years, because if you go back to the 47 Planning Act, uh, that red area would have been the green belt. And it would have been the very place that we weren't uh, developing. It was the purpose, really, of the 47 Act, precisely to stop that. Concentrate on renewal of urban centres, whether they'd been bombed by the Luftwaffe or there was, uh, they were being exited as a result of industry moving out of the city centres or because of uh, clearance of uh, the slums. And what we were actually delivering uh, was both urban renewal, but also uh, through the New Towns programme, uh, trying to realise uh, a post-war vision uh, reflecting that of the Garden City ideas of Ebenezer Howard, but put into a, a much more state-run context. And the context of the new towns, of course, was that they were very large, uh, but that's because we were moving people out of places, we were moving factories out of places, we were taking decisions to relocate people rather than inviting them uh, to relocate. We no longer do that and just hold on to the fact that the average person only moves eight miles. Well, in a world of choice, therefore, query of big cities a good idea. They're certainly highly infrastructure uh, intensive, very big upfront costs, 
And, you, uh, and, and Milton Keynes, the most successful lot, only ever delivered 1,800 homes in the peak year, and it was delivering initially entirely council housing effectively forced moves, although people were happy to go because they were being given uh, a much better lifestyle. But for the last 30 years, this has been the traditional pattern. How did it come about? Well, it came about because we abandoned the New Towns program, massively extended the Green Belt because we thought population was declining, so it was a free political offer to people to say, we're not going to build all around here. Uh, and then uh, we saw, uh, uh, with Rogers and others arguing for new urbanism and densification on grounds of sustainability. And the argument for doing this is that these new housing estates can use the facilities of the existing settlement for jobs, for, uh, for shops, for hospitals, for schools. The problem is that this is, creates an area of huge conflict because it puts housing just where the 47 Rate Act recognize that people don't want it in their backyard. Because they don't like it and nobody wants to release it, we release as little land as possible, and that means that the values go up. So this land is now not just an area of conflict, but it's an area of enormous cost to build on, with those values baked in and people sitting on the land until they can realize those values, uh, because they know sooner or later the development will come their way, because it's sequential development and they're next in the sequence. And because they want to maximize value, uh, they will also do the development slowly because the purchasers of the land for development need to get a very high level of house price to pay the landowner the amounts that they've already agreed to pay them. So they release the housing slowly to maintain maximum house prices. And then we say, well, why aren't the house builders building more to keep house prices down? Well, that's because their model is actually to build less in order to keep house prices up. So it's conflict poor economic value, and we get housing estates rather than mixed use because the mixed use won't pay its way. You don't get parks, you get tiny gardens, and everyone relies on all the facilities of place. So these locations, and planners will often say walking distance to the town centre, nobody walks. Nobody walks. They're often disconnected by route anyway. You have to come out onto the major road to go back into the town centre, and you rely on workplaces, shops, facilities scattered all over the town centre. And what do we know about traditional town centres? Well, of course, they're already congested and put more cars in and out of them, and you increase the congestion. So here, you've got very slow car movements. Here, coming down the main road, soon we'll be driving electric vehicles. And depending on how you've generated the electricity, your carbon impact may be little or nothing, and the road space is there. And you can pick up people at park and ride to get them into the town, or indeed get them into a park and ride up here, so they don't even make that journey. But if they're coming in from the estate, they're not going to drive out to a park and ride to come back in. So we're filling the place up with the thing you can't solve with electric vehicles, which is congestion, lack of parking places, gridlock. And all of that contributes to a deeply unsustainable model. So in the name of sustainability, in the name of walking distance, we've become deeply unsustainable. And these housing estates get denser and denser and denser because of the values. And because people say, oh, we'll get denser, and then we use less green fields. But these green fields are the flood relief for the town. And by building extremely densely, with little or nothing in the way of gardens and parks, of course, we then have to create forms of urban uh, sustainable drainage, which used to be called parks and gardens and not building at too high uh, a density. And then we say we don't like all the cars, because everyone in these estates has to drive everywhere, uh, and we create parking courts to keep them off the roads. And the irony of the parking court is it just doubles the amount of tarmac for what in a garden village or a garden suburb or a garden city would have been the back gardens and the tennis courts and the community uh, facilities, whilst they just drove on slightly wider roads lined with trees and grass, uh, which were, again, quite sustainable, and people could park outside their front door, which is what they want to do. And they actually do do, even when you put parking courts in, because they don't like going in the parking courts. So what you get is narrow roads, which no one can get down because there's lots of cars parked in them, and parking courts full of broken glass and no cars which everyone's frightened to go in, uh, and is a self-reinforcing problem. Now, that's just one picture. I've got another picture here which just illustrates it. So here's the predictable areas of development. 
probably can't see them, but lots of pound signs. You've just massively increased the value. The rest of this trades at agricultural values, 5,000, 10,000, in some areas, 2,000 pounds an acre. This may, in more popular areas of the country, easily trade at 500,000 pounds an acre with planning permission. That's why we don't have any facilities. That's why we don't have any parks and gardens. That's why we don't have any shops. That's why we don't have any workplaces. Gradually, these black blobs appear, and what people get is the very thing that they argued against. They thought they were going to get horrible development, and they get horrible development because Persimmon can afford more for that plot of land than anyone else by putting as many little boxes in as possible, although they are 1.5 meter apart, which creates these very strangely shaped little houses because you can sell a detached house for more than you can a terraced house, even though terraced houses in our traditional communities are actually amongst the very most popular. So we're not sustainable. We've got conflict, we've got huge cost, we can't deliver the housing numbers because we're making it as unpopular as possible, and we've forgotten everything about the 47 Planning Act that was designed specifically not to do that to our historic communities. That's garden villages. So here we have these dotted, there, you wouldn't have so many quite so near, but it gives you the idea. What you have just done is taken them out of the areas of high land value and put them in places that have low land value. And you capture that value to build in the parks, the gardens, the shops, the doctor's surgeries, uh, the workplaces uh, within that as a placemaking investment. But you can make it work financially because you're not paying ludicrous amounts of money for the land. And by the local authority controlling the process and taking on the land to deliver it in cooperation with the landowner or through compulsory purchase under the New Towns Act, we also have certainty of delivery and take away all the planning risk from the house builders. So placemaking becomes the job of community and master builder, master developer working in hand in hand with a development body. House building becomes a process of selling houses on service plots in competition with lots of other people doing the same thing, and it becomes about quality and price. And instead of going smaller and smaller and smaller in the 20th century to the point we're building the low, smallest houses anywhere except Italy and Estonia in the European Union, we start to see people actually being able to breathe, have gardens, because, of course, these fields are actually the ones that are most valuable to people arguably in sustainability terms the most valuable because they are actually the lung of the old communities. And here we can take just a little bit more land for parks and gardens and reasonably sized plots. But in doing so, we turn monoculture bio-deserts into complex biodiverse environments which are called parks and gardens and even tree-lined uh, streets. Sustainable? Absolutely. And in the 21st century, this journey I'm not bothered about because it's probably an electric vehicle and hopefully will be produced in low carbon or zero carbon ways. And I can pick them up at the park and ride before they start to congest my town centre. But of course, what I can actually do is provide a high speed bus link, forget the rail, because Rail is actually very expensive and quite rarely available. But I can provide high-speed public transport routes and capture people within their village in the first place so they never even drive down the road to the park and ride, because why would they do that if they're going to have to go on the park and ride later anyway? But most importantly, I can create a sustainable community. By that, I don't mean major hierarchy benefits. You're still going to go to the cinema here. You're still going to go to the big shop here. But this you can afford, because you've got the land cheaply, to put in place the kind of social infrastructure that actually means people spend most of their lives locally and not traveling. Most journeys are not the journey to work. Most journeys are all the journeys that involve the cafe, the park, the leisure center, the, the football club, the, the children's school, of course, an absolutely major uh, uh, driver of place. And most of those things can be built into the village because we've grabbed the value of the fields before they've turned into 500,000 pounds an acre. And that 495,000 pounds an acre we're releasing is what we can use for placemaking 
at no expense to the taxpayer. This was all envisaged in the 47 Act, except that they talked about larger new places. But then in an era of state control, they would. In a modern world, we know where people want to live, and it's places like this, strong communities. But we've just done something else by allowing this, and here I'm going to finish. We've not just created a more sustainable pattern here, but of course, we've suddenly taken out the expectation that, the, that this land is going to be developed, because now I've got the option of doing it wherever I want. So what do I say to this landowner when my city or my town says, well, actually, maybe we would like an urban extension, but we'd like it to be more like Hampstead Garden suburb than a persimmon estate. We'd like it to have facilities and schools and doctor surgeries, but actually it might add something to part of our town to do that. Well, now we can say to the landowners, we're not going to pay you 500,000 an acre. The deal is we'll only develop if we can create as good a place as we can create here. So you've just changed the no whole notion of land value in the UK from one which is about a rationed resource where you know where the diamonds are and you'll only sell them for the price of a diamond to one where we acknowledge that land is not short in a country where only 1.5% of England is houses. 1.5% is houses. It's 2.2% if you take into account gardens. There's a lot more road. There's a lot more factories. There's a lot more all sorts of things. But that's what it is. So to deliver the houses we need is tiny, fractional amount of land that we need. So let's do it sustainably and properly. I hope I've convinced you that that's a way to go. I hope that's interesting. I hope that changes ideas about what sustainable development looks like. And the best thing of all, what we're offering now is exactly the kind of neighborhood that people actually say they want to live in. Thank you very much indeed.